In this session, we'll take everything that has been covered thus far on visualization and mental programming and apply it to specific areas in our lives, to the dreams and goals that are most commonly sought by most people. You'll be provided with a bank of imagery processes and visualization techniques that have been utilized by successful and high performance persons in raising self-esteem, creating and maintaining high level health and wellness, managing stress, and overcoming addictive habits such as cigarettes and overeating, and of course, sports training. Consistent with my teaching style, I would like to provide you with additional left brain insights that will help strengthen your belief in the power and credibility of visualization and increase your understandings of the interplay between consciousness and creating one's reality. Physicists have pointed out that there are four basic forces in the world. The strong nuclear force, which holds electrons in their spin around atoms. The weak nuclear force, which allows things to break apart, such as cells that die and are regenerated. Gravity and the fourth force, electromagnetism. Einstein struggled for years to discover the law, or what he referred to as the unified field theory, that is the glue that holds everything together, but to no avail. More recently, however, an increasing number of physicists, including Sir James Jeans, feel that the glue of the universe is consciousness, both collective and individual. It's a provocative thought, especially since the universe, ourselves, and our bodies are made up mostly of space. Theoretical physicist Dr. Friedhof Capra pointed out that in order to get a clearer perspective on the basic stuff of the universe, in order to see an atom, Imagine an apple becoming the size of the earth. The atoms of the apple earth would appear about the size of a cherry. In order to see the atoms more clearly, expand the cherry to the size of the Houston Astrodome. Sitting on the 50-yard line about the size of a speck of salt would be the nucleus of the atom, the proton and neutron. Orbiting around the outer circumference of the astrodome, the size of a speck of dust, at millions of times a second, would be the electron. That's an awful lot of space inside each atom. Dr. Copper goes on to say that all the atoms of the universe, if they could be compressed down to no space between them, would fit inside the astrodome. All the atoms of the universe would fit inside the Houston astrodome. To take this one step further, if you break down the constituents of the atom into subatomic particles, and even further, you would find that the ultimate stuff of the universe is vibration or resonance. In other words, these ever so tiny forces of vibrational energy will increase the vibrations to form a subatomic particle and thus the first building block of matter. But the basic stuff of the universe is pure resonance which is what thought or consciousness is believed to be comprised of. Quantum physicists go on to say that every substance in the universe has its own unique frequency, its own unique signature resonance, much like snowflakes. No two are alike. Each has its own signature, its own song. For example, the molecules and atoms of gold have a very slow resonance, whereas the molecules of air vibrate much faster. Everything in our reality everything resonates between the electromagnetic spectrum of red and violet, red being the slowest vibration and violet much, much faster. If we look at our bodies, each organ has its own signature or ideal frequency of health. Imagine the body to be like a symphony orchestra with the brain-mind as the conductor. Through recurring faulty habits or thoughts, it's conceivable to put one of the sections of the orchestra out of tune or out of sync with the song of health. Let's say the violin section, which might be analogous to the digestive system, begins vibrating at different notes or frequencies. In time, this could throw other sections of the body symphony out of tune. You might say, gee Lee, what does all this quantum physics stuff have to do with the visualization process? Well, if one visualizes, let's say, a healthy stomach, which is holding the image of the ideal, most healthy frequency in one's mind, one could conceivably visualize that target organ back to health or to its ideal resonance. 
This is where the consciously held image stimulates the subconscious to rediscover the body state of grace, or high-level wellness, or natural harmony of health. Dr. Deepak Chopra, an internist and endocrinologist in his book Quantum Healing, captured this concept most elegantly when he said, If you want to know what you were thinking three or four years ago, look at your body today. If you want to know what your body will be like in three or four years, check your thoughts today. In other words, your body is crystallized thought, crystallized frequencies and harmonics of consciousness. This is what we have been saying throughout this seminar. All beliefs, positive and negative, have their own signature or frequency, and thus our reality is crystallized thought. By changing our consciousness through imagery, we create the ideal resonance of success in different areas of our life. After all, what is the subconscious but a different resonance of stored information than the conscious mind? That is why hypnosis is so effective at retrieving lost memories. By changing the octaves of consciousness, or downstepping the vibrations of consciousness, one can begin resonating with the harmonics of your subconscious. By holding mental pictures of ideal outcomes or goals, we are reprogramming, re-educating the subconscious into an ideal frequency. So, what are some of the ideal frequencies or mental images in different areas of our life? Let's begin with self-esteem, the basic building block, the hub that holds the spokes in place of our wheel of success. I don't want to spend too much time on defining self-esteem since it is a very intricate process. I'll provide you with the broad strokes of the brush so that you may consider some of these qualities on a conscious level. People with high self-esteem set appropriate, realistic expectations and goals for themselves. They take risks and have the courage to explore new thoughts and boundaries for themselves. They forgive others and themselves. They let go of resentment and therefore live in the present instead of the past. People with high self-esteem trust themselves and select people in their lives who they can trust. They express their feelings immediately and authentically without using them to manipulate others. They appreciate the worth and importance of other people and therefore focus on serving humanity. As Mother Teresa said, the greatest good is what we do for one another. One of the most common traits of those with low self-esteem is a feeling of undeservability or shame that has been reinforced by ridicule and put-downs. Low self-esteem persons also tend to give their power away to others, spouses, employers, and then go on to blame and argue for their limitations. Martyrhood, or creating one's life through struggle, hardship, no pain, no gain, is a frequently recurring theme in people with a low self-estimate. In short, people with low self-esteem give up responsibility in nearly every area of their lives. There's much, much more. But if you recognize any of the above qualities in yourself, do what is necessary to consciously strengthen the ones that raise self-esteem and stop reinforcing those that weaken your self-esteem. I'll now offer you a range of visualization techniques to enhance self-esteem, and you can select one or several of these techniques that feel right for you. Of course, all imagery work should be done in a deeply relaxed state. Go into your magical garden and find a very special pond with a calm surface. Gaze at the calm surface of the pond, which represents your conscious mind, and the depth of the pond, which represents your subconscious. Drop a beautiful stone representing inner confidence into the pond of your mind and let it sink deeper and deeper, anchoring itself deep within your psyche. Then. Wrap your consciousness or outer mind around this stone, allowing it to become the source for inner strength, confidence, and other related qualities that you wish to strengthen in yourself. You may then drop other stones into your pond, representing happiness, mental calmness, concentration, or whatever for ego enhancement and self-esteem. When I first used this exercise, I added little bubbles of air gently flowing up to the surface from each rock, 
representing an ongoing flow from my deeper self to the surface of the qualities I wish to emphasize and strengthen in myself. I also added the suggestion that these qualities are becoming a permanent part of my life. I've used that particular imagery very successfully with patients who have wanted to stop smoking, lose weight, and even significantly reduce pain. Another powerful visualization for enhancing self-esteem is to think of a time in your life when mentally and intellectually you were at your best and you could take on any mental challenge. Hold that image of yourself at that time, which could also be today, in your mind's eye and pump it into your subconscious with gusto for about 30 seconds, stimulating your deeper self to help you rediscover that state of grace. Then, think of a time in your life when physically you were strong, healthy, and proud of your body image, and pump that image into your subconscious. Next, think of a time in your life when you were emotionally grounded, loving, and loved. Bring that image into your mind's eye and hold it for 30 seconds, knowing, of course, that whatever images you hold with desire, expectation, and imagination will come into fruition with repetition. This is also a very effective image process, and I utilize it with almost every one of my patients that I do hypnosis or guided imagery with. Here's a third technique for enhancing confidence and self-esteem. Go into your magical garden and notice a large, multicolored hot air balloon off to one side, tethered down by weights and sandbags. Walk over to the basket beneath the balloon and place inside the basket any self-doubts, old issues of martyrhood, victimhood, shame, feelings of powerlessness, or whatever is appropriate for you so that you can lighten your load and feel really good about yourself. As you do that, imagine and feel, really feel, increased feelings of confidence, power, assertiveness, joy and happiness as you untie the ropes and watch the balloon filled with your unresourceful behavior gently float away, never to return. I might add that once you select a technique, do it several times, and with each reinforcement will come an increasing sense of comfort, inner peace, and personal pride. Here's a final self-esteem technique that I use with people who have had a rough childhood, particularly if there's been a history of physical and or sexual abuse. Go into your magical garden, take yourself into a deeply relaxed state, then go inside your head and picture your brain. From within the very center of your brain, sense a small, crystal clear spring of water gently rising and overflowing from the top of your head like a small fountain. Feel or sense the water flushing out of every deep crevice, ventricle, the limbic system, and the outer convolutions of your cortex, the residue and sludge of negative attitudes, not being good enough, shame, betrayal, victimhood, or whatever, represented in the form of a gunky, sludgy waste, like old crankcase oil. Once it is flushed out and the water coming out of the top of your head is pure and clear, then fill your head with a powerful, brilliant, white, healing light and let it shine. Next, visualize your heart, either real or symbolic, and the bottom third of your heart filled with a thick, molasses-like sediment representing old hurts, betrayal, abandonment, ridicule, excessive punishment, self-pity, or guilt that has turned to resentment. Then, open a drain at the bottom of your heart that exits outside of your chest and drain off all that negative energy. Once empty, fill your heart with a light color of your choice and feel throughout your whole being light, love, wonder, gratitude, joy, and a sense of inner healing. A powerful, powerful exercise. Our entire perception of health and illness is undergoing a dramatic change. The strongest wave of change is recognizing that our attitudes and the mind-body relationship 
can profoundly influence our state of health and disease. A new science, psychoneuroimmunology, is establishing that how we think and feel can profoundly influence our immune system, the body's primary defense network against disease. While I cannot do justice in this brief overview of the role of imagery in healing, I would like to provide you with helpful suggestions that you can translate into healing imagery relevant to your health issue. Under no circumstances should visualization replace medical or psychological treatment. It should be used as a complement or adjunct to working with a healthcare professional. The best technique that I know of for self-healing is known as transformational imagery. This is where a person's own subconscious provides both the diagnostic and healing imagery. Again, you begin by going into your magical garden, take three or four minutes to progressively relax all your muscles, then mentally go to wherever your symptom is in your body. Ask your subconscious to transmute the symptom into an image or symbol representing the symptom or health problem which usually takes no more than 20 or 25 seconds. Then, mentally talk to the symptom symbol. Ask it where it came from, why it is there, and what needs to happen for it to leave. Once this is clear, ask your deeper self to provide you with a healing image. Wait until it comes, and then superimpose the healing image over the symptom image and allow the two to interact for 30 to 60 seconds or longer, unless there's an underlying self-sabotage need or doubts that you can get well, the healing image will win and transmute the symptom image into an end picture of healing and normal function for that target organ or condition. For example, a recent patient of mine had her severe rotator cuff muscle tear accompanied by considerable pain. His subconscious saw the symptom as red-hot ambers with the occasional flame licking up. His therapeutic image was a can of cool, medicated healing foam that was absorbed through the skin and both relieved the pain and allowed the greatest range of motion. He has been using this imagery three to four times a day with considerable success. Another person with severe psoriasis saw the skin lesions as irritating grains of sand. The healing image provided by his subconscious was somewhat more involved. In his magical garden, he stood next to the nearby stream, took off his skin like you would take off a one-piece jumpsuit, dipped a palm leaf into the cool water, and cooled his skin with it. Next, he dipped the palm leaf into a vat of propolis, or honey, and covered the skin lesions with honey, and then allowed the healing energy of the sun to absorb the honey into the lesions. He had no idea why his deeper mind suggested the honey image. But in discussing this case with one of my physician friends, he pointed out how honey has no bacteria in it at all and has been used throughout history to treat different kinds of skin conditions. My patient responded beautifully, and I was left with a sense of awe and wonder at the inner wisdom contained within our deeper minds. This particular technique is a quick and relatively easy way to tap our deeper knowing. Incidentally, if your symptom imagery appears more powerful and overcomes the healing imagery, I would recommend a consultation with a healthcare professional to look into the underlying dynamics of your symptoms. I have been doing cancer counseling now for over 18 years and have learned a great deal from my patients as to what kinds of imagery works best and what imagery seems not to work as well. Fifty years ago, one in ten persons got cancer in their lifetime. Today, one in three people will get cancer, half of whom will respond to treatment and survive. I don't know of anyone, and I'm sure this is true of you too, who isn't touched by cancer in some fashion, where either friends, family, or relatives have had to be treated for cancer. Before offering imagery techniques that have been most effective in working with cancer, there is now an increasing body of evidence to suggest there is a carcinogenic personality type or certain personality qualities that may predispose a person to developing cancer. The type C behavior pattern or personality seems to be unfailingly pleasant appeasing, and more importantly, unable to express emotions, especially anger. 
the type C person has more concern for others and leaves their own needs unattended. They are generally lacking assertiveness and tend to use denial as a defense mechanism. Thus, if you have a friend with cancer and fits the type C personality type, encourage them to be more assertive, to stand up for their needs, and most important, to get in touch with their feelings, especially negative ones, and express them. This is where psychological counseling can be of great benefit as a complement to the medical treatment. Before beginning any imagery work with my patients, I always encourage them to obtain the June 1986 issue of National Geographic, which very graphically displays all the cells of the immune system and is helpful in creating more anatomically correct immune cells to begin the healing process. Healing imagery for cancer ideally takes the form of increasing the number of white blood cells and imaging the cancer cells as weak and disorganized. One may wish to include the chemotherapy or radiation as killing cancer cells, but not destroying healthy cells. Some suggestions for healing imagery are, one, seeing the white blood cells as white tigers eating their prey, cancer cells. Two, a white knight with a laser sword. The white light of the laser sword is God's white light that reduces the tumor with each visualization session. Three, a powerful healing white light energy being breathed in through the crown of the head and acting like an electric dust buster, zap, zap, zapping each time it atomizes a cancer cell. Four, little white Pac-Men chomp, chomp, chomping away pieces of the tumor. Five, waking up bone marrow factories and seeing the assembly line stamping out billions of perfectly working cells to be made into specific immune system cells. The best imagery for generalized healing response is a white healing light, beginning in the deeper portion of the brain where most of the control centers of the brain reside and visualizing the white light restoring a sense of balance, harmony, and health to both the specific symptoms and the whole body. A word of caution, don't rely too heavily on visualizing changes in the target organ and symptom without making lifestyle and mind style changes. Otherwise, you may end up dealing with just symptoms and not whatever it was that set you up for the illness. Of course, the harder you work to visualize healing imagery, the less effective it's likely to be. Again, balance your imaging with the focus of the left brain and the playfulness of the right brain. Basic to maintaining a high level of health and wellness is keeping stress levels as low as possible. The American Academy of Family Physicians estimates that two-thirds of all visits to a family doctor are prompted by stress-related symptoms. This year, stress alone will add $75 billion to employers' health care costs costing corporations $750 annually for every U.S. worker. Stress is the leading contributor to the six leading causes of death in the United States and Canada, coronary heart disease, cancer, lung ailments, accidental injuries, cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide. Rather than providing you with imagery for stress reduction, I would like to describe the best researched and most effective technique for managing stress that I am aware of. It's a basic meditation technique developed by Harvard cardiologist Dr. Herbert Benson, who relabeled the process the relaxation response. The technique, by the way, is very similar to transcendental meditation. First, pick a mantra or focus word that might represent a quality you wish to reinforce in yourself, such as peace, calm, love, or for example, the word I have been using in my meditations for two years, harmony. Find a quiet environment, sit comfortably in a chair, spine erect, head upright, both feet on the floor, with your hands comfortably at your side or on your lap. Close your eyes, progressively relax all your muscles from head to toe by moving your awareness into different muscle groupings. Next, breathe slowly and naturally. As you inhale, clear your mind as best you can. As you exhale, silently repeat your focus word, drawing it out to create resonance. In other words, don't say love, peace, 
but rather love, peace, to yourself, of course. Assume a passive attitude, and if other thoughts creep in, just assume an oh well attitude and return to your meditation. Practice from 10 to 15 minutes once or twice a day, and within a very short period, you will produce the most remarkable changes in your body, including a decrease in oxygen consumption, an increase in alpha spikes in your EEG, similar to long-term meditators, a decrease in blood pressure, muscle tension decreases, more blood is shunted to the brain, a decrease in cholesterol in high cholesterol persons, a lowering of lactate or stress and exhaustion levels in the blood, and a decrease in plasma cortisone, a stress hormone in the blood. All of that, all of that, for 10 to 15 minutes a day. One additional suggestion, if you are pressed for time, take advantage of the deep relaxation at the end of your meditation and take the next five to 10 minutes to do the mental programming of your goals. I usually end up doing my programming at the end of my meditation three to four times a week and it works in beautifully to my fairly fast-paced lifestyle. One of the most powerful addictions, even more addictive than heroin, and the second greatest contributor next to alcohol to our soaring health costs is tobacco. While there are many effective stop smoking programs that are readily available, including the nicotine patch, may I suggest the following imagery to complement whatever approach you select to break the nicotine habit. Go into your magical garden, awaken each of your senses one by one, progressively relax yourself, and then mentally go inside your lungs. If you have been a longtime smoker, there will be portions of your lungs that will look dark and gunky, representing the nicotine, tars, and over 200 carcinogens contained in cigarette smoke. Imagine you have a powerful, healing, white laser light, perhaps shaped like a small pencil flashlight. Use the healing laser to transmute the darker, unhealthy portions of your lungs into a nice, pink, glistening, healthy-looking tissue. Always do the healing visualization at the beginning of your imagery process. Next, imagine you are walking down a road. You come to a fork in the road. You can see smokestacks and a heavy haze of polluted air if you were to follow that road. The other fork is the non-smoker's path. Clear, fresh air. Colors and smells are much richer, and you can feel yourself breathing much, much easier. Next, orient yourself into the future, where, as a non-smoker, you can connect with your feelings of success, joy, pride, and vibrant health. Luxuriate in those feelings, just the feelings, and pump those feelings into the marrow of your being, anchoring the feelings of success with being a non-smoker. In this future ama state, see yourself jogging or swimming and being able to do so quite effortlessly without labored breathing. Incidentally, the most successful drug, alcohol, and tobacco de-addiction program that I know of is held at two state penitentiaries, Kansas and Kentucky, with a 64% cure rate. The treatment Inmates enrolled in that program are taught to meditate daily and then jog for three to five miles each day. The beta endorphins released during jogging and meditating create a special energy and natural high that relatively quickly replaces the high from drugs and that particular state of relaxed alertness that smoking cigarettes seems to produce. Another major health problem is obesity, with one out of five North Americans on a diet program of some kind. Unfortunately, dieting simply does not work, and between 90% and 95% of men and women who have lost weight through dieting have regained it all back and more within two years. Obesity and lasting weight reduction is a very complex and multifaceted issue involving genetics, altered body chemistry, intestinal transit time, varying metabolic rates among individuals, family history experiences, nutritional habits, amount of exercise, self-esteem, and for many women, unfortunately, unrealistic cultural sexual expectations. A very sad commentary on this issue, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Welfare, 
70% of normal weight women want to be thinner. 23% of underweight women want to be thinner. And 80% of 10-year-old girls claim to be on a diet. Appalling. Again, I don't want to reduce a very complex phenomena to just visualize it away, but to complement visualization techniques with common sense lifestyle changes rather than diet. Based on my experiences in having conducted a number of weight loss seminars over the years, the following imagery has proved to be very helpful and effective. Project yourself into the future to a time where you have achieved your ideal weight and body image. Then, mentally fuse, become one with your ideal body image and fit into it like a glove. Get into the feelings of joy, pride, happiness at having achieved your goal, and then create a collage of images, such as standing on a scale and seeing the indicator stop at your desired weight. Feel the agility and lightness of your body as you walk or find yourself in an aerobics class. See yourself in a mirror at a clothing store as you try on a new outfit or suit, and again, feel the inner pride and feelings of accomplishment. Shopping at a supermarket and purchasing only food that has sound nutritional value and whatever other mental snapshot that would be appropriate to reflect achieving your goal. In two recent studies, there were encouraging results of persons using imagery to influence physiological functions. For example, take your imagination to the very center of your brain and picture the master gland of your hormonal system, the pituitary, about the size of a small cherry, glowing in an aura of white light. Then, create a strong inner intention and expectation of it releasing an optimum amount of hormones to break up body fat in the most healthy way possible and at the ideal body clock time for maximum benefits. Next, picture your butterfly-shaped thyroid gland slightly below your Adam's apple, glowing in healthy radiance, functioning optimally to create the ideal metabolic rate for you so that you can lose weight in a healthy and evenly paced fashion. Finally, picture all of your endocrine glands, perhaps as a string of Christmas tree lights in your body, functioning harmoniously and optimally for you to create a slow but steady ideal metabolic rate for healthy weight loss. I suggest that you experiment with these different images until you find one or two that complement each other and feel right for you. The final suggestions for special applications of imagery are in the area of sport, both amateur and professional. As a sports psychologist for Team Canada in the Commonwealth, Pan American, and Olympic teams, I have seen an exponential growth of mental rehearsal with every sport from hockey to badminton. Athletes utilize both process visualization, that is, where you mentally rehearse a golf putt or backhand tennis stroke over and over until it is wired into your neurology and end goal pictures like holding the Stanley Cup, celebrating being the best team in the National Hockey League, or the cup designating you club singles tennis champion. Arnold Schwarzenegger, in his biography, described how his success was attributable to visualizing every single barbell curl, every repetition on every muscle grouping, hundreds of thousands of times, while the other fellows in the gym were probably fantasizing about being on Bikini Beach. Visualization techniques will vary depending on the sport. In my work with gymnasts, I had them visualizing during their routines over and over in slow motion and then describe exactly what it was that worked best. We also broke the routines down into segments, such as a particularly difficult twist and mentally rehearsing it in slow motion. Then, we speeded each segment up, but with a special emphasis upon the kinesthetic sensations in different parts of the body and developing a muscle memory for the ideal torsion and twist, back and forth, speed up, slow down, and with very little practice, the routines became subconscious and habitual. Jean-Claude Keeley, a three-time gold medal skier, reported that his only preparation for one race was to ski it mentally over and over. 
He was recovering from an injury at the time and could not practice on the slopes. Keeley reported that the race, with just mental rehearsal alone, turned out to be one of his best. Again, it's difficult to do justice in such a brief report on the power of mind in sports. The best reference in this area is Michael Murphy's book, The Future of the Body, which contains a rich body of research and examples on how athletes from many disciplines have transcended physical limitations through the power of visualization. I'm looking forward to reconnecting with you in our next session, where I know you will be delightfully pleased with the exciting process I will be sharing with you, how to create and live your dream of the future.